um, through that time because we had a lot of miners on the sides of hills and they needed to have sanitation and the councils were given central government edicts to actually clean things up. So we need to get back to a time. So what used to happen is a, a claim would be, and it's a 47 time priority, so you put a two-year prospecting in because we didn't know what the 66 million acres of New Zealand was all about. So what used to happen is people would put in a two-year claim uh, and that would like, give them the right soil, the gold and silver that was there for the next Next 47 years. So after two years sending the data back into the Boeing house in uh, sixth floor in the in Wellington, um, they could then go on to a five-year expiration. Uh, and so they'd send more data in. It's a little bit more intensive. And then they were granted a 40-year mining license. And so that then meant that they, whatever they collected, they need to pay 1% to the Crown and the 99% whoever had the time priority, they owned the gold. So in the old days, those little claims that they used to have, they'd find a nugget and they'd go down to the local hotel, they'd put it on the bar. You know, three weeks later, once they'd had baths and food and bits and pieces and they'd spent it, they'd get tossed back out, you know, onto this, their claim again and they'd have to go and dig a little bit more until they found another nugget and it would go back in. And so what the government would do is, with taxations of tobacco and, uh, and income tax for the proprietors of those hotels and and alcohol tax and that sort of thing, it would get back to the central government. So all the gold money in the cents would all sort of circulate back off the countryside and go through. So we need to look at that side of things with regards to uh, Minister of Revenue, Nash, um, we just calling out you're also fisheries minister white gold is another thing for fish uh, and you are a small business so we need to have a discussion there Mr Nash and you're also police minister so obviously we need to maintain law and order right most people are and you know you look at all of the uh, money that's being printed right now right we we've had this huge increase in government spending in the last year right since COVID although so our government spending is about $140 billion over the next three years, uh, and that's just um, that's the spending that New Zealand's put in. So we've done a similar thing here in New Zealand, uh, and so these guys are talking about what's happening in the government States. Government spending was already ramping up uh, under, under Trump before COVID, but now it's just kind of gone ballistic, right? So we're, we're spending unprecedented. We're going to have a budget deficit of maybe three, four trillion dollars, right, this year. I mean, incredible. The budget deficit. Um, and, but where's that money coming from? Right? I mean, the government is spending all this money. I think our percentage of borrowing to GDP was about 20%, and then we've gone up to 40% here in New Zealand. Um, overseas countries, some of them were close to 100% before COVID even started, and some were over that. So that's a sort of a limit. So they've been pushed way past over 100% of their gross domestic product. And bear in mind that shrinks when you have a recession, and he talks about a depression and um, hyperinflation. So it's not stagflation, which is stagnation, which is a recession and inflation. He was talking about depression and hyperinflation. And when this, uh, you know, happens, we are, we're talking a serious global depression. And one of the um, economists, New Zealand economists on the radio, in the early days of this, um, before the budget, said, uh, New Zealand should buy up all of the um, debt that the 14 Australian banks have. Um, he said because it's a 20-year depression, and when you buy those um, titles of those homes and those mortgages and stuff, it means the government can then make sure that there's equity uh, and the egalitarian society continues on. Because what at the moment we've got a six-month rent freeze and 50% of New Zealanders are not paying their rent. Uh, and so at the end of that six months, and it's coming up in a couple of months' time, then all of a sudden the landlords have to pay the banks and stuff and there's going to be things like foreclosures and people will be out on the street looking for another place and they don't have a job. The husband and wife both being made redundant. And so we're in, we're in a large before the storm. That's why I'm making this video now before it actually comes. This is a for, what is it, to be forewarned in a sense or to be proactive, there you go, not reactive. So we know that this is happening and so we need to be proactive and that's why we need to make decisions for the next 20 years. That's why this election is going to be important and this video will feed into it. Um, anyway, let's listen a Who's bit more. Who's paying for it? Who's getting the bill? Right? The idea is that, well, nobody's getting the bill, right? Nobody's taxes are being raised. In fact, people's taxes are being cut. So 
how are you paying for all this government, this massive increase in government spending? You don't get all this government for free. Somebody's got to pay the cost. The idea is now, well, nobody pays for it because the Fed is just going to create the money. Well, OK, well, what happens when the Fed just creates money out of thin air? Because the Federal Reserve doesn't produce any products. It doesn't provide any services. Um, one of the things that's gone up, and that's cigarettes, um, and that's a very expensive item. Um, and from my perspective, I've got jobs and stuff that need to be done on the farm, just basic things like putting staples and battens and stuff like that. And what I'd find very fascinating is if, the, which the government can do, it can... Um, a bottle of beer and a um, and a packet of cigarettes. Um, some people will work for uh, um, an hour or so f to do that, so they get a bottle of beer and some cigarettes. So there's certain things that we could do in the world, uh, or in South Waikato, or in New Zealand, where a person is quite happy. Not the minimum wage and all of that sort of stuff, but there's some jobs to do, and if they do it, you tick a box, and they can go down and they can get their couple of bottles of beer and a packet of cigarettes and, and a feed, if you like, uh, and boom, that doesn't cost anything to create. It's something which is um, it, it, it's a it's used, but it's it's it has the qualities of money. It's acceptable. Um, it's relatively scarce. Um, it's portable. Um, it's transportable. Um, and um, it's acceptable. And we'll go through the qualities of money. It's not durable in the sense that it's there, but from a governmental perspective, recycling the bottles and filling them back up again or um, more tobacco planted and stuff like that. So we're in dire times, and we need to think of clever ways of just keeping people just to do the normal day-to-day -day things. They just need a food and a place to shelter and just some enjoyment with their mates so that they can have an enjoyable night playing eight ball and stuff, and then the next morning they wake up and they can do a few odd jobs, and things are gradually improving. That's what we're after, gradual improvement. It just creates money, right? And so if there's no additional goods and services, just a bunch of money, all that happens is the money that already exists loses value. So now when people get that money that the Fed printed and now they can buy stuff, they can only buy stuff because the people that had money before can buy less. Because now we have to increase prices so that the, the, the greater quantity of money you know, can buy the, the, the same quantity of goods. And in fact, right now, because of the economic shutdown, not only are we printing more money, but we're producing less stuff. And that's the other thing, producing less stuff. So in the farm, it can be more productive. Like I had sheep here, um, but that was uh, very labor intensive with shearing and all the bits and pieces that went along with that. And so it wasn't cost effective to get labor and pay 20 bucks an hour minimum wage and that sort of thing and and so that's what new zealand has to become vibrant with regards to those staples of life because people are quite happy to go along for five or eight weeks you know in a lockdown situation but they're also quite happy just to do simple jobs out in nature which the sunshine grows plants and so you've got broccolis and carrots and stuff and like I said there will be five things in New Zealand that I would promote one of them's water so we have a bottling of water the ability to send water overseas uh, and that's such a valuable resource to 190 countries so you can tick a box if you want to be involved in the water game and so there's lots of jobs around that whole plumbing and carrying and forklift driving and truck driving and on the wharves and sending water out to locations they send the silver or gold back to us and we give them water. The other one's food. Um, and so people can get involved in food production. And then you go through the third and the fourth. And then the fifth one is you have to have something aspirational like the participation on venturing to Mars, for example, and getting a million people on Mars with Elon Musk. So we've got people there that are developing that sort of technology with computers and, and that sort of thing. So as I said, there's five things, and, and people sign up to those because underemployment is something which we have in, in a country. So instead of working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, we've got people that um, are zero seven days a week. And so the point that needs to happen is some people will be quite happy just to work for um, I'm not suggesting a packet of cigarettes and, and, and a bottle of beer but we need to actually have that as the baseline If and so people can self-monitor that and people who can ask to get 
given those things for jobs around the place and of course it's going to need to have some teething problems but I'm just suggesting that we've got five major things and those are the third and the fourth one I'll explain a bit later but we'll just do food and water first and then the, and the trip to Mars uh, fifthly just to get sorted. We're, we're providing less services. People that used to be employed making things and providing goods and services are, are at home doing nothing and just cashing government checks. And so the way we're paying for all this government is with a massive inflation tax. So that's what we're finding with the um, price of um, stuff at the supermarket. We've already seen it. And so this guy's just explaining government it. government is going to steal the purchasing power of anybody who has U.S. currency. See, the other thing is um, New Zealand banks are... Um, New Zealand, $50,000 over the 14 Australian banks. So you'll get a situation where money in the banks, if someone's got money in a bank, well, it's not going to be guaranteed. And so when banks start falling over, um, all of a sudden that money disappears. Um, that's a tragedy situation in New Zealand. And so this is why we need to find, I'm not saying the gold and silver bullion side, but there needs to be a trade in that. But there needs to be ways where people can have land titles through the conveyancing of land and stuff. So we need to look at, let's get everyone with a freehold section, one in urban environment and one in a beachside or rural environment. So you've got 5 million people. So that's, that's 10 million new properties, you know what I mean? And so then we are able to help councils out because people can pay property taxes. But then people have got a bit of land that they can grow some food on and they can do certain things. And it means the businesses are growing because people are buying concrete and they're buying, you know, the builder's pole and stuff like that. So this is why with a small 